So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Guillaume Emon. I work at Igalia, a 10 years old company. And, uh, well, we do many free software things. We're basically a con consultancy. Uh, we're international uh, with headquarters in northwestern Spain. And today I'm going to talk about uh, playing in the sandbox. Uh, so in that case, when I say sandbox, I mean a restricted execution environment. So the idea is that uh, you have something executing in a sandbox. It cannot touch what's outside of the sandbox. So you have a program in the sandbox. It cannot like, access or modify uh, all, the, all your data that's like the grass and the trees around. Um, and so uh, I've run so some experimentation with sandboxing uh, in the context of JStreamer. Uh, and the kind of problem I want to solve, uh, it's to explain this, I'd like to give some context. So first, what, what is internet? Internet has been, as you all know, designed so that people can watch cute videos of animals, such as baby hippopotamus, or that's Joe the hippo, some of you might know him, I don't know. Um, or, well, unicorns, uh, dogs, chickens, whatever you like. Cats are overrated. Um, but then the question is, when you watch videos that come from various sources on the internet, uh, a random website, can you really trust that data? And can you really trust the people, like, look at his eyes. Can you trust that hippo? I wouldn't. Because uh, uh, there's a, so there's data that we might not be able to trust. And we conjugate that with complex software, such as a video decoder uh, of like various complex codecs. Uh, and so we have complex software written by humans. It can have bugs, it can have security bugs. And you could imagine to have uh, some online videos. These guys, that's just a cute video of a hippopotamus that could just uh, be a specifically crafted video that would uh, try to take advantage of a bug in your dec decoder or demuxer or whatever part of your pipeline. And, uh, try to do bad things on your computer. Uh, and so we don't want this to happen, and that's why I've started uh, this research. And so the idea is to do the dangerous things with that data we cannot trust inside a sandbox. Um, and related to that, there are um, to explain the timing issue, uh, a bit of biology. So this is uh, an ant that is infected by a Nophiocordyceps unilateralis. Um, that's a fungi that uh, basically infect ants and the ants become zombie ants and don't behave like a regular ant and just end up going in on some leaves that are well positioned for the fungi to be able to reproduce and go on its next cycle. Uh, so, so basically the ant is not evil in itself, but once it's contaminated, it could be dangerous to other ants in the, so uh, it, it could be dangerous to other ants and so, and contaminate them. So we have the same case we are like with like our software decoder. Unlike say uh, Java applets that we, you, you would download from the internet, the code that we run here uh, that you use to decode your video, it's code that is not evil in itself. Like initially you can trust it. The problem is once it starts to handle data that we cannot trust. Um, 
so that allows us to to first uh, in, have some initialization, initialization part, and let the code like open the files on all the devices that it will need, uh, and so like take all the resources that it will need to operate, uh, and then. Once this is done, we can drop privileges, and we want to drop privileges before we start to handle dodgy data. Um, so the experimentations that I've run with that is basically uh, I have written um, an element that I called sandbox decode bin. So what it is, is basically um, a decode bin that runs in a separate process, which is in a sandbox. And uh, the sandboxing system that I've used uh, is called SetUID Sandbox, but we'll see later that there are many other systems that could be used instead of or in conjugation with that. Uh, uh, I'll explain more about the various sandboxing solutions that we have on Linux later on. Um, and so the, this is what the sandbox decode bin looks like. Uh, so it is an element that uh, has like one sync pads and two source pads over there. Uh, so the sync pad goes directly in an FD sync. Uh, and then like the orange part here is the separate process. So the FD sync is used just to send the data to to the to the sandbox process over, over a file descriptor. Uh, to be more efficient, we could probably use shared memory, but it still works pretty well like that because as the video is still encoded, it's not like that huge. Um, and uh, so then I pass it to a decode bin, and the output, the, fr uh, the video frames, and the audio buffers go through GDP, then to the shared memory elements, and they are depaid on the other side, and so that in the end you just have like the buffers that you get here are just like the buffers that you would get here. So it's basically so that the whole this whole sandbox decode bin basically behaves like a decode bin too. And um, well, I didn't prepare any demo because demos never work, but trust me, it, it works, it kind of works. Um, it has some issues. Uh, and uh, yeah, but the timing that was mentioning earlier, uh, so the ID, wh what I do in this element, but that wouldn't work u universally, is that first we we take all the resources. So I like kind of count on the elements to take <laughs> the resources that they need, like the elements that run inside the sandbox. So that's like this FDA. SRC, the decode bin, GDPDP, and SHM things. So once we are in ready state, I consider that we can drop privileges. I drop privileges, and I have to do this at that moment because when we switch to post, buffers start to be processed. So you could have a buffer. You start processing an under, uh, untrusted data you could have a buffer that uh, tries to trigger a bug. Um, so first we drop privileges, then we can go to pause and go to playing and, and play the video and be merry. Um, so, but there are several issues with that. Um, first, uh, a lot of elements acquire their resources when going to post. Uh, that's I think that's true of uh, about everything based on uh, GST based SRC, for instance. And another issue is the cleanup, because with this model we can acquire a resource. So uh, I especially met the. Uh, I still have the problem 
with SHM Sync because SHM Sync creates um, the shared memory area with it, uh, on the control socket for it. But then once I've dropped to village, I cannot uh, I cannot uh, delete, delete that that unique socket that's open on the file system, and I cannot clean up things. So potential solutions to that. Um, first, well, the last one is what I do for the case of SHM sync. That is, uh, the I use the encompassing process uh, to 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 uh, to do the cleanup when like when going back to to null. And uh, other solutions could be uh, using a finer grain sandbox, one that wouldn't uh, prevent you from doing anything, basically, that wouldn't be as restrictive as SetUID sandbox that I've used so far. Um, so for instance, a sandbox that would allow you to say, uh, okay, you can use the closed system call, but you can use it only on this FD. And, or like a sandbox where you could set that kind of rules. Um, we could imagine to modify elements to acquire everything when going to ready. Uh, but uh, that kind of would be, that would be a quite big change on how things are usually done and on the definition of the like ready and post states. Uh, you're supposed to, to go to ready, you're supposed to check uh, to, to like say what the design documentation says. Uh, when you go to ready, you're supposed to check that your, uh, the, all the resources that you will need are available. Uh, but you should only like open the resources if you need that to check that it is available, as it should just be opened when going to pause. Um, another solution which I'm thinking of, uh, I might go in that direction that needs a lot of talking, but maybe introducing uh, a signal uh, that could be called like all resources acquired or maybe something more clever, uh, just so, so that an element can say that it, it has acquired its, all its resources and like, it is the time when we can drop privileges. Uh, and ideally, that should happen before starting to, to handle da data for that element. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure this one. So other big limitations uh, that I have with uh, that first uh, experimental element, uh, it's that uh, communication, if you look at the pipeline, um, problem is like through SHM, SRC on SHM sync, you don't, and that's the same with GDP, you don't have elements that can go upstream. Like in particular, if you have a seek event uh, somewhere there on on your on your sync, you send a seek event, it will arrive in GDPDP and just be ignored. So basically, with this, you cannot sync, you cannot seek. So uh, that can be annoying when you want to play videos. You often want to do more than that and be able to seek. Um, So, where was I? Oh yeah, uh, another issue is the overhead uh, when going through all these SHM source and SHM things. There are a lot of mem copies happening on uh, GDP encodes and decodes things. Oh well, and so this takes time and like. One quick uh, measurement that I did, uh, doing a playback first through through a regular decode bin two and through sandbox decode bin uh, of a 720p file. So on, uh, on my machine, it was using 20 to 30 percent CPU, 
depending on the on the moments uh, of the file. Uh, but when using sandbox decoding, it was going up to 30 to 40 percent CPU. So if you consider the maximum values, uh, it means that the maximum CPU usage would uh, would go up by one third, which is quite big and can be significant on some devices. Um, so you now, yeah, I've mentioned that I've used uh, CetuID Sandbox. Uh, I guess I probably should have known better, even though, like, because there are actually better systems. No, but uh, this is quite recent stuff. So CetuID Sandbox, uh, it's a project that's originally one of the sandboxing system that they use for the Linux port of the Chromium browser. And uh, it's based on the, it's a combination of various uh, tricks from Linux. So first it does a clone with a clone new PID uh, flag, which means that uh, it creates a new process ID file systems. So uh, inside, uh, no, a new process ID namespace, sorry. Um, inside that namespace, uh, uh, like the first process that you create in that na namespace will just have a PID of one internally. As, as far as it's concerned, uh, as far as it can know, uh, its, its process ID is one. So it's like a kind of new init and then it can create other processes in, in that namespace. Uh, so that's uh, part of one is, that's a, some insulation. You get more insulation by uh, by running it under a separate user ID and group ID. And if you mix that by putting that on top of it in, a, in an empty CH root, uh, then you, you are in a good way to prevent your program or your process from accessing data outside of that CH root. But it can be tricky. Uh, like, well, they are very, uh, you have to be very careful on, for instance, the file descriptors that are opened at the time when you drop free privileges. Uh, for instance, if you have a file descriptor opened on, uh, on a directory, uh, then you have a syscall, I don't remember its name, but that allows you to, to open files relative to that directory and you could access files outside of the, the CH root in that way. So it's probably better than nothing, but you have to be very careful with what you, you do, and it's not like totally trivial to get it relatively safe, uh, to get it as safe as you would want. And also, it's not very granular. It just like prevents you from accessing files outside of the CH root. Uh, that's basically what it does, but you cannot uh, you cannot prevent any syscall that you want, and you cannot uh, allow it to access some some of the resources that wouldn't be on your CH root. Uh, so another system that's been around for a while is SecComp. Uh, it's even more restrictive because uh, when you have a process that runs with SecComp acti activated, or what I would call the old style SecComp, you are only allowed four system calls, like read, write, exit, cigarette, and that's all. So you can basically just read and write from a file descriptor that you would have opened before, before activating SecComp. Um, the Chromium guys were using it also at some point. Uh, they were doing some crazy things. Um, so the idea is that they had a seccomp enabled thread, uh, but so that they could actually do stuff because the, the web rendering uh, engine WebKit is likely to need to like access fonts, for instance, or to do like a lot of things that ca cannot be done in such a restricted environment. So uh, the idea is that uh, they would 
make the system calls in another thread because uh, so seccomp is uh, putting the limitations on boxing a thread. So if you create another thread uh, before activating seccomp, you could use that other thread to do the, the syscalls for you. But then it is quite tricky because your main sandbox thread that runs code that you can that you don't want to trust can access all all the memory space that your trusted thread that will do the syscalls controls. So that means that your second thread that will run uh, the syscalls for you and check the the parameters that you give to the syscall and check that all these syscalls are stuff that are in like a policy that you want. Um, so this thread, this controlling thread, cannot use any volatile memory. Uh, that means, in particular, that it cannot use a stack, which means it has to be written in assembly, and that's when the crazy things start. Uh, also, it cannot check some uh, syscalls such as open, for instance, because open uses uh, a, uh, has a string as a parameter which has to be in volatile memory. So for that case, they were uh, passing the, that data to another thread. So another thread was checking uh, checking the um, that the parameter to open was uh, was correct, was acceptable. And then uh, sending that back over a shared memory area that is only writable by the other process, uh, so that in the end the uh, trusted controlling thread would do the syscall after checking by another process, and uh, it it would do it using a parameter that's on a shared memory area that's only readable for 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 that process, so that the untrusted code cannot modify it. And well, that kind of that kind of tricks. Uh, they the the Chrome guys were like experimenting with it, using it. They got a w system that I think was working relatively well, but it's uh, really a, like a, a lot of duct tape. Um, so luckily, there is a new system which. Uh, was developed by the people uh, working on Chromium as well, uh, which is SecComp with Berkeley packet filters. So the Berkeley packet filters is a system that's already been used for years, uh, tens of years probably, uh, to, to do like uh, network packet filtering. And uh, so the idea was to re reuse um, this method of filtering pa packets to filter syscalls instead. And there's a user land library called libsepcomp uh, that uh, even facilitates more the use of this new kernel facility. That's in the kernel since 3.5. That's also at least in the kernel of uh, Ubuntu 12.04. So that's already relatively widely available and it will be uh, on all the all the main distros pretty soon, um, and so the idea of that system is that you can really say which uh, which system calls you allow and which you don't allow, and you can do filtering on the arguments of the system calls as well. So you can say, okay, uh, you can call close like the example that I was citing, or you can close all you can call close, but only on this file descriptor, or you can call open, but only on this set of files. Um, so you can uh, you can be very fine-grained on what you allow and what you don't allow. And uh, so this system will be like in most kernels pretty soon. Uh, and it doesn't uh, like require anything more than having a standard kernel from like the distributor or the system administrator. So we can like set the whole policy uh, as a developer, we can, that's something that we can do. Uh, and then you have AC Linux, which is kind of the opposite because this is uh, 
part of the infrastructure. So that's something that is installed on some di uh, some distributions because it's not standard, and it allows you the kind kind of the same kind of things that to have a relatively fine grain control, but it's a policy that should be set by the administrator or or by uh, the distribution. Uh, but the developers can like suggest rules, but then it's like not really their responsibility and they don't really control directly the rules that would be applied to to a process. So it's something that can be interesting uh, if you want to have a sandbox system for for Gstreamer, we could we could have like suggestion make suggestions of rules for other people to use for integrators to use. But in the end, that's not like our direct responsibility. And so uh, going forward, uh, after these experimentations on the limitations that I've seen. Uh, there are several things I would like to do. Um, first, one idea to like uh, solve a lot of problems, including the one that we don't have upstream communication, so no queries and uh, no upstream events, which means no seeking and no quality of service and no like we miss on many things. So one crazy idea which is being popular, like we've talked a bit about it with Wim. Hello, Wim. <laughs> uh, and, and with uh, Sebastian, is uh, Would be to have uh, basically proxy elements that would uh, allow you to have like a rather fine grain control over a pipeline running in another process. And like this system, like if we develop interfaces for that, we could even use them on more crazy things like a fine grained control over a pipeline that's running on another machine. Uh, and so that could have a lot of flexibility to Gstreamer in general and solve this problem as well. Um, another idea that's like more lazy would be to just put the whole pipeline uh, inside of the sandbox. So if we have a granular enough sandbox like the SecCom BPF system, uh, and if we know relatively well in advance what kind of elements we will want to use, which is often the case, uh, at least in the case of a web browser, because you just want to support like the source that you're going to use to get the data from the web and and you want to support uh, the HTML5, uh, the, the codecs that are uh, supported by HTML5. So it's probably going to just be uh, Octera VP8 and H264 for, as for the video codec, plus like a few audio codecs, um, but it's so we could, uh, for that, have re uh, generate the right rules that would restrict the pipeline in a way where we could kind of feel safe. Um, also, we should need to develop an architecture for that that would be relatively would be agnostic to the sandboxing system so that we could easily use AC Linux if it's available in the distribution, easily use uh, seccomp BPF if it's there, uh, easily use other sandboxing systems if we're on OS X or on Windows. Uh, and also at some point uh, the performance issues should be analyzed. Like if you use SHM everywhere, like we should probably try to be clever about, uh, about how we use it and find ideas to uh, minimize the amount of uh, memory copies. But uh, yeah, there would be a lot of profiling and optimizing to do, but well, right now it's a bit early to think of that. Uh, for 
as uh, the old saying goes, uh, first make it work, then make it fast. And um, yeah, that's about everything that I wanted to say. Uh, thank you for attending. And if you have any questions, you can ask now or around the beer later. Yes? Uh, I'm just curious if you're aware of any GStreamer bugs that would be exploitable in the kind of attack vector you're considering. I, I didn't really bother uh, really looking for any bugs. Uh, like I, I went with that like from a theoretical right. standpoint, if you want. Because okay. uh, I believe that it's there. Theoretically, from a theoretical standpoint, I believe it's relatively likely that we could have one, especially if you consider the many many codecs supported in GStreamer, and that everybody uses codecs uh, and elements that are from from uh, bad or and that could be just code that is not checked properly. So. No, we we wouldn't need that anymore. But but then the the tricky part, uh, or well, kind of tricky part, is that we would need to uh, allow that process, that sandbox process, to access, uh, for instance, like uh, the XV system. Uh, so have a pretty good, big access on wherever we want to output our frames. So it could be XV or it could be OpenGL. Or it could be like some other big systems like that that in themselves could have bugs. And so basically, we would uh, have a relatively big attack surface. Uh, we would widen the, uh, the attack surface by, by having everything in, in, in the pipeline. So that's the, the big limitation. For Sorry? Yeah, you could do that too. And yeah, and because yeah, else you you would have the issue if you sandbox only your pipeline is that you still want to control it. So you need an you would need an IPC system. So maybe just something like these proxies I was mentioning. Other questions? Good, so we can all go to lunch. <laughs>